confrontation with this very important subject, um, Western media and Islamism, was in 89. And uh, for me, uh, the year 89 is in a way really uh, a symbolic year in a double, in a double sense, not only for the, uh, because of the fall of the wall, but also because of uh, the um, uh, fatwa against uh, Simon Rushdie. And um, this was in February 89, some months before the fall of the wall. Uh, I then was uh, working um, at uh, the Tax, which is a left-wing uh, German newspaper, and um, uh, I had there an editor who was, in a way, the, the informal authority, because we didn't have formal authorities there, um, of the cultural pages. So, um, Arno Wittmann, which I admire um, uh, very much, and he had a very beautiful idea at the moment of the Rushdie affair. His idea was to publish the first chapter of the Satanic Services. All, all, all German, all big German journals should publish, uh, was his idea, the first chapter of uh, the Satanic Verses on their first pages. So he called all the papers, uh, Frank Schirmacher from from the FAZ and uh, Ulrich Kreiner from uh, the, the Zeit, and there was very much enthusiasm uh, in the first moment, but in the last moment, the Taz was the only journal which published the first chapter of the Satanic Verses. And this was the first time that I understood that there is perhaps only one subject which causes real physical, corporal fear. In Western journalism, in Western journalists, and that is Islamism. Uh, and this real, real concrete fear which it causes this subject is there until today. And um, you know, uh, in the moment of the cartoon crisis, there was not even a question anymore. It was like normal that the papers didn't print the cartoons, cartoons which were completely harmless completely in the range uh, of, of what is uh, legitimate in, in, in Europe and in the United States. But it was clear, without any discussion, that CNN or the New York Times or the Guardian or, or the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung or Le Mans didn't publish these documents. So it was a strange moment because it was a huge international debate, but the journals were not able to inform the public about the cause of it. So this is um, what shows, I think, um, this really strange uh, uh, relationship uh, that we have to this subject, Islamism. And uh, so I'm uh, looking very much forward uh, to uh, the, the speech of uh, Mr. Landers, who is uh, better qualified than anybody to speak about it. So thank you for being here. Somebody wanted to put them on the uh, in index, but I didn't really get involved in the response subsequently. But I didn't realize that this idea to publish it on the front page, which I think would, would have been the appropriate response, should have been a response to the uh, uh, cartoon incident. And as I remember with the cartoon incident, in fact, there were far more European papers that were willing to publish those cartoons. I was disappointed that the Americans let the Europeans down. I mean, in 2005, from America, it looked like the Europeans were buckling under. And, uh, you know, that's when Mark Stein wrote America alone. It looked like America was the only place that wasn't going to let this happen. Uh, and then the cartoon crisis happened, and then America let Europe down. Um, subsequently, we elected a president who was behaving like European leaders from five years ago. Um, we can get into that, but not right away. Okay, so what I'd like to do tonight, first of all, let me ask you, how many people here know about Muhammad Abdullah, the boy behind the barrel at the beginning? I'll show you a picture of him. Now, how many people is this picture recognizing? Uh, let's 
to young people in the room. No, okay. And uh, how many of you know what the controversy about Abdullah is? Okay, and how many of you have seen evidence? All right, so I'm going to show you some of the evidence. I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to burden the audience with stuff they already know, but if you don't know the evidence, then I'll go through it. But first, let me start with some remarks about cognitive warfare. Um, and um, I'll leave my notes up for review because I know this is in English, so I, I know at the EKGF, when somebody gives a German talk, I always ask for a copy of the, the, the talk so that I can follow it in, uh, with my eyes as well as my ears. Speaking of which, um, my book is gone, but it's the varieties of the millennial experience. That's Tausendjährige, or Kiliasmus. And it's about um, apocalyptic beliefs that a new world is about to dawn. And there, I have a chapter on the communists, I have a chapter on the Nazis, and I have a chapter, my last chapter is on global jihad. And since 2000, I've basically stopped doing medieval history and started following a contemporary manifestation of medieval history in the global jihad, which is an apocalyptic movement which I heard about in the 1990s from a classmate of mine, Dan Pipes, uh, who told me that the Muslims, Islamists, wanted to have a green, the green flag of Islam fly from the White House and the Queen of England wear a burqa. And I left. Um, I didn't laugh long because as a student of these kinds of things, I knew that just because people who had outrageous hopes about the future, about conquering the world, about perfecting mankind and bringing peace and justice. One of my chapters is on the Taiping in China, a movement in the middle of the 19th century that Taiping means the great peace. By the time it was done, 20 to 35 million Chinese were dead. 14 years of millennial warfare will do that to you. Um, and so, um, I knew that just because they wouldn't be able to do it didn't mean that they wouldn't do a lot of damage in the process. So I started paying close attention to uh, global jihad, and in, in particular, another point, you say 1989 was significant in the double term. It's actually significant in the triple term. Uh, term. And that is that 1989 is the year that the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, led by Osama bin Laden, drove the Soviets out of Afghanistan. Now, you may not think that that's a big thing, but for them, it's not only a big thing, but I can guarantee you that in their view, the fall of the Soviet Union was because of what they did. Right? So 1989 is, in fact, a real turning point. In fact, we can sort of just for the sake of it, take the creation of the internet. Uh, 8990 is really the years that the internet took. Um, I started email in 1993. Uh, by 2000, I used to, by the, the late 90s, I was telling my students, you have to get an email address. Um, by 2000, they were being given email ad addresses as they registered as students. Um, so, our world has been transformed. 1989 is a very good year to take. And one of the interesting points about uh, Salman Rushdie to understand in terms of cognitive warfare, which I'll define in a moment, um, is that as Chile pointed out, there's nothing terribly offensive about it. Okay, there is one with you know a bomb inside of the turtle. But the fact is, we actually have suicide bombers who have hidden bombs in turtles. So it's not like this is, I mean, it's critical, but it's not outrageous. It's not like, it's not like, oh, I didn't call it out this time. All right, I'm thinking of Shalom's, uh, Shalom's. Not like that. 
that's shallow Eden babies, Palestinian babies, even though it's based on Goya of Kronos eating his own babies, but okay. Um, so what is so offensive, what was so terrible about these uh, cartoons? Well, the argument that was being made to us by Muslims was that it is an offense to depict Muhammad. Now, the fact is, it's not an offense to do. It is not permitted to Muslims to depict Muhammad. It is not permitted to Christians and Jews, Dimis, subject peoples, in a Muslim nation to depict Muhammad. But outside of Islam, there's nothing that says we can't depict Muhammad unless the purpose of this is to extend Sharia to outside of Dalai Islam. To extend the laws that bind Muslims and their subjects to the rest of the world. So this was really an act of cultural jihad, and that's what cognitive warfare is like. And, and the reason that I bring this up is because in terms of my situation in the late 90s with the, being warned about the millennial ambitions of a global caliphate um, by Islamists, although I took it seriously as potentially very damaging, mostly Muslims, Muslims in general, I mean like the Chinese suffered from the Taiping Rebellion much more than the Westerners did, um, in addition to it being dangerous, it never occurred to me that it could succeed. And yet, the lesson that I've drawn from the last decade is that once you understand their tactics, they are wildly successful. Successful far beyond anything I imagined them capable of doing in the, back in the 1990s. I have been stunned over the last decade at how much ground the West has lost to the cognitive war that's waged against them by global jihad. So with that as an introduction, let me go into it. Briefly, then I want to focus specifically on the way the media has participated in this process um, in a spectacular and central way. And then I'll close with some more remarks about why I think the media does this, and then we can get into a discussion on what do we do? How do we go? So, what do you do? Okay, so the first thing is that the reason why we all laugh when the first time we hear that Muslims want to take over the world or Islamists want to take over the world, the reason that we laugh is that it's ludicrous. The West is great and powerful, Islam is backward. Um, most people thought before 1979 that Islam was going to vanish. Uh, my professors, when I was in college, uh, just assumed that Islam was withering away because it was another religious superstition that was going to go. In fact, I remember meeting a sociologist in 1979 and said to me, 19, I met him in the 80s, 1979 was the death of sociology. And I said, why? He said, because sociology was based on the Weberian paradigm of the inevitability of secularization. And 1979 turned that completely so, 79 is actually, in my book, that's the beginning of the current wave of uh, global jihad that we're dealing with. It's an asymmetrical war that they're fighting. They cannot possibly win this on the battlefield. And the symbol of their inability to win it on the battlefield is they can't even defeat tiny Israel. The humiliation of Israel for the Arab world is that no matter how many armies they put together, and no matter how much they outnumber Israel with men and weapons, and planes and tanks and so on, they always lose. And it's been a, a, it's been a nightmare. It's been a catastrophe for them. Okay, so in the asymmetrical warfare, they cannot win on the battlefield. And in fact, the battlefield is no longer the key place to fight it. The key place to fight it is cognitive warfare. And that's something we don't understand. We're always looking at the battlefield and saying, but we're stronger. So we don't have to worry, and we're being constantly outmaneuvered on another chessboard. Now, on the other chessboard, what you've got is cognitive warfare, which is uh, there's a whole 
field of study in, certainly in American and British um, military, uh, uh, military studies known as psyops, psychological operations. The difference between psyops and cognitive warfare is that psyops is largely aimed at faking out your enemy on the battlefield. So it's still focused on the battlefield and it's sort of an addition, uh, tricks you play. Cognitive warfare is aimed at winning over home audiences. It's aimed at publics. And it's aimed at two publics. It's aimed at your public and it's aimed at your enemy's public. And the purpose of cognitive warfare is to convince your enemy to be pacifists and your own people to be patriots. And in the case of the Arab-Israeli conflict, what the Palestinians do is they seek, and this is part of the reason is that Jews are so susceptible to guilt, they seek to paralyze their enemy with guilt and to incite their own side to hatred and revenge. And they do that with something that Nietzsche Polar has called lethal narratives. A lethal narrative is, if you will, it's a garden variety bloodline. It's a story about how the enemy is evil. The enemy kills children on purpose, happily. The enemy is murderous. The enemy is ruthless and heartless. And we are innocent victims. And that is the fundamental tool that Palestinians have used against the Israelis. Now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead to the story of Muhammad Abdullah. Uh, oh, let me just spend a little time on our susceptibility to this. We in the West are extremely susceptible to the cognitive war that's being waged against us. For a variety of reasons, we in the period after World War II, have achieved a level of commitment to civic values um, and therefore an openness to what somebody has referred to as memes or sort of idea units that are infectious, uh, that are extraordinarily pacifistic. Um, but there's a bumper sticker in America, war is not the answer. It's very popular. If you go to Cape Cod, which used to be inhabited by Native Americans who were wiped out in a war, to make way for the pacifists who have words not the answer on their porches, um, those signs are everywhere. Uh, another meme is, who are we to judge? We're not in a position to judge. How can we say that this is wrong and this is right? Wouldn't it be cultural imperialism on our part to say that honor killing in the United world is patriarchal and offensive? Um, life and peace are the most precious values. And as a result, we blind ourselves. We don't want to believe we're at war. There is a massive population of intellectuals in the academy and in journalism who are committed above all to saying we are not at war. And terrorism, it shouldn't be a war on terrorism. Terrorism is a criminal action that should be handled by police and by courts and not at, as part of the war. Now, how it should be handled is one matter, but behind this insistence is, and which leads to a great deal of, uh, shall we say, denial of reality, behind this insistence is a desperate need to believe that we're not at war, that in fact, if people don't like us, it's because we haven't been nice enough, we haven't shown them how nice we are. And by the way, I think that this is a particular American disease. Americans desperately want people Love them, they walk around with smiles on their face all the time. They try and, they try and, you know, the only reason that you don't like me is you don't understand me. I'm really a nice person. Okay? And I think by and large that's true of the West and the West in vis a vis the third world about which we have justifiably some guilty conscience. On the other side, we have people, and I'm not saying this is true of all Muslims, but I am saying it's true of jihadis. We have a culture of death. We have a culture that worships death, a culture that praises death, a culture that seeks death, and a culture that believes that its commitment to death is its strength, and our commitment to life is our weakness. 
Um, and this goes back to Khomeini who was writing this stuff well before he became the head of um, uh, uh, Iran in 1979, and it also um, pervades the thinking of Hassan al-Banna, who founded the Muslim Brotherhood, which has recently been anointed moderate by the American State Department. Okay, so, um, so let me go into what I think happened with the story of Abdullah as not just, it's, it's, it's an illustrative case of what's going on, but more than an illustrative case, it is a really serious, it is, it's more than an illustrative case, it is, It is the case. It's in, in cognitive warfare, Muhammad Abdullah was a nuclear bomb. Um, absolutely terrible event. Why not? Well, no, I did not. Um, oh, here it's okay. It's the first one. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is the last part of a tape from Talalat Rahba, who is a Gazan photographer who works for CNN and for Charles Mandela and France too. This is the footage that he took at um, Netzali Junction and sent to Charles Mandela on the 30th of September. <laughs> Literally um, 
sequence after sequence in which Palestinians, you hear gunfire, Palestinians are either standing around or taking uh, cover, but uh, none of it is related to what the Israelis are doing. That footage that I showed you at the beginning here, behind the factory, where it looks like they're running from an explosion from gunfire. Um, here's the factory. The Israelis are on the other side of it. They never left their position that day. There's no way that any of these people could be threatened by Israeli guns. Okay? So um, I'll come back to that when I deal with Palin in a moment. But in the case of Muhammad Adua, there were lots of reasons to wonder what was going on. For example, here we see a scene where the boy has his hand over his eye. Now, he's allegedly been hit in the stomach, and we see something that's slightly red down here. He's allegedly been hit in his stomach. Those of you medical people here uh, know that if you die from a stomach wound, you die because you lose blood. You bleed out from the stomach wound. And just to uh, those of you who are squeamish, you can look away right now. I'm going to show a picture of the boy in the hospital. No, I'm not. No. I had a small accident before. And Pretty gruesome picture of the boy in the hospital. Uh, and he's got a huge gaping stomach wound. Um, and the reason that he has that is because Oslo work, 
and therefore one would think that he would be careful about throwing a uh, Molotov cocktail into a, a very um, overheated situation. This is two days after Shaul visited the temple. Now. Okay, so this is what, in fact, he did do. This is Charles L. Dallas, uh report. father doesn't lie on the boy when this shooting. A normal father would throw himself on the boy when uh, shooting. Okay, yes. In fact, the father would put the boy in front of him behind the barrel. But okay. But in terms of the footage that you saw first in this footage, did you notice anything? I've studied this a million times. He took out that last scene. He took out the scene in which um, the boy lifts up his elbow and looks out. Now he says he did it because he wanted to spare the audience because of how unbearable it was to watch the death of the child. But I think that he took it out because people would have screamed bloody murder that this was obviously not. He had already declared the kid dead three scenes earlier and now the kid is going like this. Okay, so, so that's the situation. Now you can say, okay, he made a mistake, uh, it's too bad. But the, consequences of this mistake were enormous, and partly the consequences should be understood in terms of the way in which this story, not only, I think it was staged, not only was it staged, but it was then weaponized. In other words, it's not enough to say a boy was caught in a crossfire between Israeli troops and Palestinian policemen and got hurt. And I haven't even given you the evidence that the bullets are coming from the Palestinian side. But it's not enough to say that it must be that the Israelis did it deliberately, that they murdered the child, or as Charles on that one said, they are the target of fire, the cible de tir venu de la position israelienne. So this is what the PA did with this. The footage provoked riots throughout Israel, throughout Arab areas in Israel. And, um, one of the things that they, one of the pieces of news that footage that appeared in Palestinian TV was pictures of Israeli soldiers shooting rubber bullets at Palestinian rioters or Arab Israeli rioters. And this is what they did. Before the eyes of millions, he is seeking protection in the arms of his father, but he is hit by the damned bullets. Okay. So they insert that picture. Right? which was then picked up by all sorts of people, I think most creatively by Hezbollah. Oh, come on. Um, picked up by Hezbollah. This is a billboard that appeared in Southern Lebanon about a month after the event. So they managed to do it very nicely. Now, as I said, the Israelis never left their position that day. This is totally uh, monkeyed with. And it's put on Israeli TV, and it's put on Palestinian TV. And there's no way for Palestinians to understand what's going on here. So now, uh, this, that scene and the voiceover that you heard is from Esther Shapiro's movie which she did for Ayah uh, uh, won some awards for it. Uh, I had to run around with the bodyguard for a while as a result of doing it. 
And in it, she asked the Palestinian TV guy why he spliced in that image of the Israeli firing a gun when he knew it wasn't the case. In fact, it was taken from riots that were caused by the footage in the first place. These are forms of artistic presentation, but all this serves to convey the truth and explain a specific event. We never forget our higher journalistic principle to which we are committed of relating the truth and nothing but the truth. Okay, so this is a really good example of a cognitive warrior. This man is not committed to anything remotely resembling modern Western principles of a fair, free, and honest press, even though he uses the language. But when he says truth, he means higher truth. It's the same thing with the people, you know, Hitler acknowledged that the protocols of the open design were probably forged, but it didn't matter to him. He said it's a higher truth. It doesn't matter that they were forced. In fact, it's in the Middle Ages, the church actually had a term for this. It's a pious forgery. It's a forgery that increases faith. And that's what's important. It doesn't matter. So we're talking about pre-modern mentalities here. Um, here's my favorite illustration. One of the major problems with this entire scene is that there's no blood. I mean, if, if I were a teacher in a film class and a student came to me and showed me this footage and said, this is my rendition of the Israelis killing a Palestinian boy, I would have given him an F and said, at least give the boy a sack of blood and have him break it, or a sack of red liquid and have him break it so it spills all over the place when he's supposed to be hit. Okay, so this is how the Palestinians overcame the problem of what I call the bloodless libel. just incitement in terms of what the Palestinians did on their own TV. Um, within a couple of months of the Abdullah footage appearing, Osama bin Laden created and published a recruiting video um, which traveled around the Muslim world, not just the Arab world, the Muslim world, a recruiting video in which the story of the Palestinians and in particular the story of Muhammad Abdullah played a key role. Here's a little segment of it by Muhammad. <laughs> She's a mainstream journalist of the first order 
books to her credit and so on. And she made this remark that this death annuls the races that had won and won and won. Now this is really, I think, the major function that Muhammad Abdullah played in the cognitive warfare of the 20th century, which is that he made comparisons of Israelis and Nazis legitimate. It's not like these comparisons hadn't been made before, but they had remained at least in the United States. <coughs> relatively marginal remarks. This is Place de la République in Paris, the 6th of October. The crowd is yelling, probably for the first time since the Holocaust in a major European capital, death to the Jews, uh, as well as death to Israel. Um, and here you have star David equals the swastika, and there's Muhammad Abdullah and his father, and it says, and they also kill children, you choose his enfants see. All right, so I think that, that essentially this story operated as a major venue for turning Israel into, to quote the Nazis of uh, the 1930s, Unser Unduk. The Jews are our misfortune. Israel is the evil that, has, that is making the world a bad place. And if only we get rid of Israel, if only the Palestinians get their land, and even if that means dismantling Israel, then things will be okay. This is a major theme in the cognitive war that the Palestinians have been waging against us. And Europeans were particularly susceptible to this, even more than Americans, but the American left was astoundingly receptive to this message. The Europeans, it was more than just the left, it was, you know, pretty much uh, widespread, certainly in England and France, which are the cases that I know best. Um, the ease with which Israel was um, treated with contempt uh, was really quite remarkable uh, from this point on. And, and the point that I want to make here, uh, you know, on the one hand, Palestinians, for the Palestinians it serves as an incitement to hatred. And all of the first suicide bombers invoke revenge for the death of Muhammad Abdullah. Those of you who remember the story of the Ramallah lynching on October 12th, where two Israeli soldiers took the wrong road and ended up in Ramallah and were beaten to death, had their bodies torn apart, dragged through the streets. Um, and the crowd was yelling revenge for the blood of Muhammad Abdullah. So this was inciting the hatred. This is the icon of hatred of the 21st century, right at the beginning. Of the I hope it's the worst icon of hatred for the whole millennium, but right at the beginning, this millennium, this century started, this decade started out with this image of hatred that was sent out there. And here is a really good example of just how screwed up things are. This is from Durban, where Muhammad Adullah was literally the patron saint. That's his body down here in effigy being carried on the day. Beer. And here we have it says Israel's images of hate. This is actually Palestine's images of hate. Right? But Durban, which was supposed to be against racism, ended up being a, a conference that went insane um, attacking uh, Israel and the United States. The United States for slavery that they had given up over 160 years ago, but not a word about slavery in the Muslim world which in some cases is still ongoing. So, overall, the point that I want to make is here, so this is various places, this is October 6th. This is, there were protests all over the world on October 6th. Um, Lebanon, Morocco, I got one here from, um, here we go, this is New York. And you'll notice this woman's carrying a picture um, she's obviously not happy, and it's his murder. I mean, that's the key thing. This is murder. This is not so here. This is just to let you know that it's not just Europeans who went for this stuff. This is the Hartford Current, uh, which is you know it's a it's like the new and better uh, second. We have to we have a newspaper in New York. Okay, so Hartford's about the same size as New York. This is the local newspaper, and this is the kind of stuff that appears. You know, the Baron's gone. Sharon, who wasn't even prime minister at the time that this happened, is grinning with a gun, smoking gun in his hand at this dead kid. Now, this is, this is the bloodline, right? And what happened as a result of all this, if 
think that's all that I'm going to show you. Um, well, let me just what, actually let me show you a couple of things because it's related to um, uh, the question of journalism. I, I coined the term Hollywood as a result of studying the dual stuff because I saw the raw footage. There was I saw these scenes that Talal shot with Charles on the line, and they were, some of them were so obviously fake that we were laughing. And um, I, I said, Charles, all of these seem, seem fake. And he said, oh, yeah, they do that all the time. It's a cultural thing with them. <laughs> um, you know, talk about Orientals. Uh, and, and in fact, that's when I realized it wasn't just that they faked it, it was that the Western news had no problem with it. Well, what I discovered, so here's an example. This is my favorite example. Uh, look at this young man. If you watch his forehead, you'll see he's got red on it. I think it's makeup because if you watch the way he holds his head, even after he's being carried to the ambulance, you'll see that he holds his head high. He, he shows no sign of a serious injury, certainly nothing that would necessitate him being put in an ambulance. But watch, watch him move. I think this is a Molotov cocktail. He's holding his hand and he's going to hand it off. You can see the red. Oh, he says, we, 
And she says, well, what happened to the bullets? She said, ask the general. So she said, I asked the general, he doesn't have any bullets. Because the general said, we don't do an investigation when we know who did it. So we don't do an investigation, we don't have the bullets. So he says, so, so then she says, um, we, we took it, um, France too. And she says, well, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm joking. How long was it? I don't know. You, 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 the, you, the one from the general, he took it. From the whole Oh, okay, so. So you are doing it like that? So he says, France too collected. He's France too. Right? So he collected? So she said, you do a better job? <laughs> no, 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 we, 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 we have some uh, secrets in our for, for, for our state. We cannot give anything. Yes, everything. Right? And so, this is astounding. This is so obviously a sham that never on earth would any serious, responsible journalist allow this to happen. And the terrible thing is, I understand Charles Alain not being willing to admit this because he, his entire life and career are at stake, but that other journalists should not have challenged him, that this should even go to court, and he lose in court. And journalists still wanted to protect him because after he lost in court, um, uh, L'Express Normal, uh, Jean Daniel, um, Le Nouvel Ops, actually came out with a petition signed to defend Charles Adam our colleague, from this unconscionable assault from non colleagues who had the nerve to criticize him and therefore restrict our freedom to say whatever we want. And it was signed by people who never saw the evidence. They signed because they said Charles Aldell is a friend of mine. Of course I'm going to support him. Okay? This is really serious stuff. So here's Charles Aldell when he's asked about the boy being dead. I'm very sorry, but there is too much light, but the fact is that the child is dead. Maybe not in the moment in which he was born. She asked him about the last scene. Maybe not in this moment. But so I'll tell you a story. Das Kind ist tot, ist ein Statement. Was ist Ihr Problem damit? No journalist should be allowed to get away with this kind of stuff. And yet, he's still a prominent journalist on the uh, Middle East scene. Um, one last thing, because she asks him about the question of blood. Wenn es am Vortag passiert ist und die Sonne darauf schien, müsste das Blut da nicht dunkel sein? Und äh, nicht wenn, wenn ich bin kein Spezialist, aber am nächsten Tag war da Blut. Es gab Blut, es war dunkel, es war... Ich weiß nicht, wie das Foto entstand. I don't care. I don't care because I've got the support. Okay, so now I've, I've shown you the evidence. Let me go into some of the remarks that I want to make about the consequences of this. One of the consequences is that Adullah was a nuclear bomb. Since Adullah, it has been virtually impossible for people who are not in the Middle East and not on the ground to have any idea of what's going on. The media has systematically misinformed the public. That's more or less what I've dedicated the last 10 years of my career to, is, is tracking this. Um, it is an astonishing story. Um, I have a blog, you know, Jane Stables, I welcome you to come visit it. Uh, I started it in 2005, and, um, and it, it's just an amazing story of malfeasance by the media. This last decade, if civil society survives, I'm certainly fighting for it, um, and I think many of you here are as well, if civil society and democracy survives, then historians in the mid-20th century will look back on the first decade 20th century and say, oh my God, the journalists misbehaved disastrously. And they put the West in terrible trouble. And the problem with this is that in some senses, Israel is the soft underbelly of the West. The soft underbelly was the expression that the Allies used for Italy, which turned out to be not so soft, um, in World War II. That, that uh, attacking via the soft underbelly was the way to um, to invade Europe. The soft underbelly of the West is Israel because for a variety of reasons that we can discuss if you want, the, the Europeans in general and the West, uh, Europeans in specific and the West more generally, are more willing to believe that the Israelis are the bad guys than this uh, 
than they would be if it were themselves. Um, so it's easier to sort of let it be the other. But what we're looking at is a, a terrible marriage of a kind of pre-modern sadism, the blood libel, the way that you saw it was weaponized by the Palestinians on the one hand, and then on the other hand, and the Israelis participated in this, a kind of postmodern masochism in which, you know, it's our fault if only we were nicer, if only we hadn't done this. I showed this footage to a friend of mine who was opposed to the settlements, and I showed him that it was fake. And he said, it doesn't matter, it was our fault. And I said, well, I don't understand. What do you mean? He said, if we didn't have settlements at Netanyahu Junction, they couldn't have faked it. Okay? Now, I think it's admirable that he's willing to be that self-critical. And if he were married, uh, and he took that kind of responsibility for a fight that he got in with his wife, I think that would be a very good marriage. But in this case, what you do when you have this sort of postmodern masochism of it's all our fault and if only we were better, everything could be fixed, and this pre-modern sadism of it's all your fault and if only we can destroy you, we will be happy, is that the pre-modern sadists are the ones who win. And we are in a terrible shape. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and let, move to the discussion of the media. But this must be stopped. And if it isn't stopped, um, the prognosis is worse than it is for the euro. Can you hear that? OK, so uh, this is really this is shocking uh, material. Um, I remember that I saw the Document, uh, documentary by, by Esther Shapira. I think it was uh, five uh, years ago, something like four years ago. No, no, 2000, she did one in 2002, yeah. and then she did one about two years ago. Oh, okay. So she did I, I saw perhaps uh, the second one. But um, in a way, uh, you see in this story that truth came out with a delay of three or four years, or two or three years, and um, in this moment, the bad already happened because everybody believed in it in a way. Is it like that? Well, there's no question that um, it, was, it shouldn't have happened. And if Charles Aldema, instead of running that footage, if Charles Aldema had fired Talaha Abu Rahman and done a piece on TV about how Palestinians fake scenes in order to accuse Israelis and incite hatred of them, I can guarantee you that the history of the Second Antifada would have been different and that the history of suicide bombing in the 21st century <coughs> would be different. But the fact is that he did it, and when the suicide bombing campaign started, there were, this was Oriana Falachi's first rant, was in 2002 during Jane England, people were out on the streets, models, wearing nothing but suicide belts, mm -hmm. you know, supporting the Palestinians. So, and, and right up until now, with the Operation Cash Lead stuff in, in Germany, the Luke's party that was out there with the, and in England, people, people, <coughs> excuse me for saying this, infidels, white European honky infidels carrying signs and flags saying, we are Hamas and we are Hezbollah. Now, why don't you just put a gun to your head and shoot yourself? <laughs> you know. Where does it come from, this metaphysical when you speak about? Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fantastic book by um, uh, Pascal Brugge called La Tyrannie de la Pénitence, translated into English, I don't think correctly, as the tyranny of guilt. Um, but, you know, Camus writes about it. This is, I think it's a pathology of, um, it, it's a pathology of probably the greatest strength of the modern world, um, and that is self criticism Self-criticism is terribly important, it's terribly difficult. Some people, you know, there are some people who are addicted to running and they'll run for 10 hours a day, you know. Some people get addicted to self-criticism and it just feels so good to say, oh, mea culpa, that they end up uh, admitting stuff that isn't even true or that, you know, by some stretch of imagination. Mm -hmm. There's a, I'm thinking a little bit of a book which seems far away from this subject, which is um, uh, La fin d'une illusion, uh, de François Furet, uh -huh. The End of an Illusion. He there speaks about um, 
bourgeois self-hatred. Yes. There is a sort of, um, I don't know, cultural self-hatred in the West. Is it coming from this, what you say, pathology of, of self-criticism? Yeah. Uh, it, it's a mystery for me that... Um, but let's, let's uh, put the question in, uh, in another way. When did it start? Since when do you see this tendency of, in a way, wanting to believe in, in, in these sorts of, of, of fakes? Well, um, I'm going to say something possibly controversial here. I'm, I'm going to blame not only, but I am going to lay significant blame at the feet of the Jews. I think Jews are by nature self self critical. Um, you know, if you just look at the biblical story, you know, everybody has problems. Um, you know, you look at the the the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they, they're all doing some pretty nasty stuff. So it's not like it's a, you know, heroic tale. So I think self-criticism is built into Judaism. I think that's one of the reasons Jews do well under modern conditions, because modernity, I think, is also science, technology, you know, justice, all of these things depend on the ability for people to handle public criticism. Self uh, unashamed cultures in which it's legitimate to shed somebody's blood for the sake of your honor um, are not, uh, you know, and nobody wants to be publicly self criticized. Nobody wants to be humiliated publicly. Um, the question is how much are you willing to do to avoid it? And I think in the West we've built up a very strong resistance to violence. We've given up rules, we've given up, you know, honor killings. All these things happened earlier. So, um, and, and I think the Jews, and I think Israel has done terrible things um, in terms of admitting this Adullah story. They, are, their initial response was to say, it may have been us, and if it was, we're sorry. Now, they thought that, okay, that's it. But in fact, the attitude is, as somebody once explained to me, um, you know, most people think that you only admit something when it's absolutely true, and then you admit to the minimum. Mm -hmm. So if they said, well, we may have done it, and if we did, we're sorry, then surely they did it, and they did it on purpose, right? So, and then they wouldn't go back to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in 2003, 2004, 2005, me, Philippe Cassanti, and others were begging the Israeli government to stand up and fight this, and they won't budge. They are terrified. Um, so I think that, and, and then of course you have this, the hard left, you know, people like uh, Gidon Levy and Amir Haas work for, and Akiva Elda work for Ahabit, or, or, or scholars like uh, Abi Schleim, and I'm sure you've got a bunch of them in Germany, I mean, they all go out to the West and say, Israel is like the Nazis, Israel is terrible, Kila, that small and stuff, Israel is terrible, Israel has done all these terrible things, and they speak to audiences that just love it. You know, if I were here saying that Israel is a terrible th place, this place would be full. <laughs> you know, and it'd be up there, right? But let's, uh, to, uh, to, uh, let's take a look also on the other side because um, this is very interesting too. Because you show that is, uh, this is in mise en scène uh, uh, made for Western media, yeah. right? Also for their own oh, media, but uh, also for Western media. And you can say uh, the same thing uh, about Rashi. Uh, as fair, uh, this was a mise en scène, the, the fatwa, for uh, in the same time the own media, but also the Western media. Uh, what, what you told about the, uh, the extension of uh, the field of uh, Sharia into the Western sphere, and uh, I would uh, say the same thing about 9/11, um, uh, uh, which was also um, a sort of spectacular mise en scène, right. which was aimed at. Um, so there's a real obsession also um, in, on, on this Islamist side of Western media. What oh, yes. So, well, that? Well, look, I mean, it's ironic, mm -hmm. you know, we're in Germany, so I can talk about Habermas, and at least some people will have read him in the original. Um, but, you know, the public sphere is this incredibly precious creation that's made democratic cultures possible, but it's also you know, leaves you wide open and vulnerable. Right? Democracies depend on vulnerability. Right? In 
order to have a civil society, in order to trust each other, we have to become vulnerable. <coughs> so we are vulnerable, and it's almost as if we can't believe that we have enemies. You know, how can anybody? Yeah. I've never. Andre Gutzmann said it today in an interview yeah. debate. Uh, uh, he's <coughs> saying the same thing. He's uh, saying that uh, the Western world is, in a way, thinking that it has arrived at its end and uh, doesn't have any enemies anymore and doesn't, in a way, uh, isn't able to to uh, to get the challenge. Right, and, mm -hmm. and so okay, so that could get us back to this issue of excessive self-criticism, which is if you're in a situation where, on the one hand, you have um, uh, let's take just the Arab-Israeli conflict. All right, so you have the Israelis and the Arab and the Palestinians, and they can't agree, they can't make peace. So who do you blame? Um, you got to blame somebody, and obviously it's really important because every Arab or Muslim who speaks on the television will tell you this is the most important thing in the world. It's not what they're seeing behind the scene when the Al Jazeera leaks came out or WikiLeaks came out. We found out that, you know, although Obama was saying, oh, I have to solve the Israeli, Arab Israeli conflict and then they'll support me going after Iran, they weren't talking about the Arab Israeli conflict, they were talking about Iran. Mm -hmm. But to us, they'll all say, oh, this is okay, so who do we blame? So, you know, there was this unbelievably, uh, fortunately, notorious scene where Sherry Blair made a comment at some kind of uh, charity um, in 2002, shortly after a suicide bomber had blown himself up on a bus and killed a bunch of kids. And she said, it's terrible, it's awful, it's lamentable, but as long as these people don't have hope, what can you expect? So, you know, she's looking at it and she's saying, the Israelis have removed hope by not granting these people the country that they want. And I know that they want a country just like everybody else, just like Israel has a country. So they're normal people, they're like us. And therefore, um, it must be Israel's fault because Israel is stronger and they're weaker. The idea that, as Itamar Marcus wrote an essay in response, that, that suicide bombing is not a response to despair, it's a, it's a hope. It's an expression of a hope that by engaging in this activity, you will terrify your enemy into submitting to you. And the fact is that we're all afraid of suicide bombing. I mean, I think that in some sense, it's the reason why the newspapers didn't want to publish some of the Russian thing, and newspapers didn't want to publish the cartoons, and Yale University Press openly said, we are not going to publish the cartoons in our very, scientific book very, book mild, book. Book. very mild scientific book about it. Yeah. The reason is we're afraid that we're going to be, you know, we're going to put our people's lives But this year can also be in a sort of, uh, uh, how do you call it, a self-fulfilling prophecy in our yes. uh, Because uh, it really happened, um, when we speak about this, uh, oh, was not another story, there was a story by an American writer about uh, the, um, Youngest uh, wife of uh, Mohammed, uh, right. which was uh, uh, wasn't published at the yeah, end. Another publisher right. published it, a British publisher, and there was a uh, But if there wouldn't have been a discussion, there wouldn't have been an attack. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly think that one of the really serious problems is that you know, the way that cognitive warfare works, the goal of terrorism in cognitive warfare mm -hmm. is. I will blow you up if you don't do what I want you to do. And this is what this is what British Muslims, moderates, were saying to the British after the 7-7 bombings, which is, as long as you have a foreign policy that supports America in Iraq and supports Israel in the Middle East, we can't stop our extremists from doing this. So in other words, we want, and, and this happens with journalists, journalists are intimidated to a degree unthinkable um, uh, including New York Times journalists who will say in public, oh, nobody intimidates me. But they are intimidated and they follow the rules and the rules are you don't report negatively about the Palestinians and you do report negatively about the Israelis. And so you end up with a situation in which we adapt their narrative as a way to play game. If we tell their story, maybe they won't kill us. And in fact, we are, we're cowards, we're intimidated. That's one question before I open to the public. Um, it's a bit complicated, but I think it's important. I think that um, this weak reaction that we see in, in Western media um, in, in, in context with this uh, subject of Islamism creates also a sort of 
ideology of fear. Um, in a way, um, those journalists who didn't publish the cartoons, right. because they were afraid, right. they also have to find ways to rationalize about mm -hmm. it. And uh, they, uh, for example, I think, this is my thesis, and I would like to know what you think about it, they, they develop discourses uh, in defense of this fear. So they call the others, the other side, uh, in the Western public, uh, Islamophobes. Uh, whereas uh, they themselves are acting by fear. Yes. In not by yes. shame. The only true is like and, um, uh, Yeah, and uh, I am afraid that this situation creates a sort of unease in the public. Yes. And even can create sort of, let's say, symmetrical um, um, discourses of hatred. Right. Um, like we see in, in Breivik, for example, in this Norwegian, um, and, or perhaps also in evangelical extremist uh, schools. Do you, do you see something like symmetrical um, uh, 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 discourses of hatred which come of this um, not clear reaction of the Western public? Scott, You're right, that is a good question. It's a very good one. Uh, mm -hmm. So let me see, I don't know if I can answer it all, but let me make certain points. The one is, I've, uh, I've thought more and more about this question of intimidation, and I agree with you entirely. I think what happens is that our journalists are intimidated. They can't let us know they're intimidated because, I mean, if you were reading an article in Der Spiegel and it said at the top, this article is the product of intimidation. I mean, actually, I had a Russian friend of mine who grew up in Russia, and she said that her father would uh, sit down with her and read the newspaper, they'd read an article in Pravda, and she, they'd finish it, and he'd say, okay, now tell me what you really think happened. Or tell me what you think really happened. All right, and that's what we should be reading our journalists today, but we don't. We read them as if they're honest journalists who are doing this good news. So they're intimidated. They can't admit to us that they're intimidated, and, and here's where we get to your point. They can admit to themselves that they're intimidated. So they make up a story about how they're really on the side of the underdog and they're really helping the poor people and so on and so forth. And that they're actually, and, and the other fantasy that we tell ourselves is that we are somehow, um, we're being generous. We're not provoking them. I mean, the, the attitude to even this latest Chavier Do story was there were a lot of journalists who said, you know, Shabani Abdo is so immature, you know, you shouldn't provoke these people unnecessarily. Well, if they provoke them necessarily, that would be good, but they don't provoke them at all, right? And they, what, they, what they think is being generous and not picking fights is in fact being covered. So they, they, they sort of cover themselves with this aura of, I, I want to bring peace, I want to do this, and Shabani Abdo is a great peacemaker and so on. So it, there's a kind of narcissistic ideology here, which is deeply dishonest. And you saw it in the Brevik affair. This really drove me crazy. I, I will admit that Brevik quoted my blog. Um, uh, and he quoted it exactly right. In fact, what he quoted from my blog was that the media, the news media, are the eyes and ears of modern democracies, and that if they misinform us radically, they render us incredibly vulnerable. And that's exactly what I think is going on. Okay, so what happens is a whole bunch of people, mostly the people we're discussing here, scream and yell about how everybody that Brev excited is in some way responsible for having incited him to his acts. Now, none of us, and I mean none of us who were cited by Brevik in that, are writing, you should go out and kill, not even that you should go out and kill Swedish kids, but that you should go out and kill Muslim immigrant kids. None of us are saying that, and yet somehow we are responsible. And yet these same people will not even discuss incitement amongst Palestinians and Muslims. You will not hear about genocidal speeches given from the pulpits of mosques in Gaza and the West Bank and, 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 and shown on television. You won't hear about that because that's not nice and that's not here, and that's not, let me show you just one, and then I'll show you, if you will, what, what happens. All right, so, um, uh, 
but in any case, though it's not oh, it's not I, you see, no, but I am lost in. Um, so no, I'm not going to try it easily. In any case, a really nasty speech about to the Jews and so on, and it's quoted in an article by William Moore in the New York Times as, and Sheikh Halabia said, literally, could they're all Jews? They're all the same. That was it. He didn't, not a word about the genocide in the second. So here are these people who, on the one hand, can see incitement implicit in criticism mm -hmm. of Islam, but they can't see direct incitement as responsible for things like suicide bombings. Mm -hmm. so, so you end up, I don't even say it's not a symmetrical, it's a totally asymmetrical skew that's been produced by this kind of. Mm -hmm. Yes, but isn't it, isn't this weakness of um, the reaction of democratic uh, media um, giving space for new right-wing discourses? Because that, that, the, this fear creates taboo zones in a way. And yes. um, th this was my question. Yeah, here, um, here it is. So can you put it back on? <laughs> uh, no. uh, yes, I, I think. I mean, look, in the same way that I think that the pacifists of the 1930s paved the way for the real parties, yeah. yes, you have, you have on the left today which says, we want peace, we are peaceful people, we are nice people, we are not nasty people. Nasty people are critical and make other people feel unhappy about themselves. We don't do that. We are nice people. And they are preparing terrible things. And it's a lack of courage, and it's a lack of, and, and you know, and, and the astounding thing, I mean, this is weird, and here, uh, I am in Germany in Berlin, so uh, I'm not going to say this even though it may be highly sensitive, but, you know, one of the ways in which we have screwed ourselves is that by defining the Holocaust as such a unique and terrible evil, it's almost impossible to identify anybody else. Mm -hmm. So that you can't say, I mean, Palestinians can call Israelis Nazis, and you know, German bishops can go to Gaza and come back and say that it's just like a concentration camp and stuff. But you say that Palestinians behave like Nazis, or, and we are at the 70th anniversary of um, uh, Haj Amin al Hussein's visit to Hitler in Berlin right now, three days ago. Um, you say that there's a long history of Nazism in the Palestinian movement, or that right now Hitler's Mein Kampf is a bestseller, and that the Palestinians not only deny the Holocaust, but in the same mouthful say they wish they could finish it. Um, you're an Islamophobe, you're a racist, you're a terrible person. So it's almost as if we are incapable of identifying this kind of stuff. Um, and it's terrible, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I think yeah. that we are dealing with the dynamic, I don't know if it's identical to the 30s, but everybody should be studying the appeasement of the 30s, and no yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, there are books about it, and it's uh, it's worse. It's worse. Yeah. I have a colleague who yeah. teaches it yeah. at Boston University, who yeah. teaches it, and you should read a book, uh, Anna Geithman wrote a book called Dead Orders. It's yeah. just out. It's clear that uh, pacifism, French pacifism in the 30s, let's say the film by Renoir, which is a big classic uh, movie, he saw a Hitler in, in, a, in, in a way which was uh, really, 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 uh, um, uh, how do you say that? Making him harmless because yes. he, compared him, he compared him to the first world war, uh, you know, Colonel, which was a. And people do that with Dukhme and and Ahmadinejad. And I was going to say, so this is a colleague of mine teaches uh, appeasement, and the response of some of her students is they were right. That's what we should do. We should appease. So it's, you can't even count on people looking at the situation and saying, that was a mistake. <laughs> okay, I, I think uh, um, there, are, there are perhaps also questions from the public, and I, I hope that we, we can also find, find a little bit of a way out of this problem in which we are. Can you turn that back up? Okay. Can you turn that back up? Perhaps uh, uh, in, 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 in answering to the public's 
you can also uh, um, uh, give us some hints uh, no, no, no. about what to do, yes, because if not, it's too pessimistic, we are in November here, and uh, okay. we, uh, 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 springtime is far away, so. Other questions? Okay, uh, we need the microphone because it's uh, a off now, so it's a recorder. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to go back to this notion that uh, the whole the US thing is some kind of perverted notion of um, self criticism, uh, but wouldn't you rather be that by remaining uh, um, a member of the so called here and by criticizing it so vehemently, you become like um, rather part of the solution, not a problem, you're not part of the West anymore, you take yourself out of the equation. All right, so I, I well, let me put it this way um, there are basically three positions, you could call them means, three positions on this issue. One is my side, right or wrong. Okay? Whatever my side does is right, whatever their side does is wrong. The second one, which is the one that I think is the basis of modern civil society, is whoever is right, my side or not. Which means that there are times where you have to admit that you're wrong. And we're all wrong some of the time. So the idea that we're never wrong is crazy. But also the idea that we're always wrong is also crazy. And that leads us to the third one, which is the postmodern position, which I think is really a pathology, and that is the other side, right or wrong. And that's what we're looking at. So, for instance, in the Goldstone Report, um, uh, Hina Jilani, who's a Pakistani judge, was asked about the reliability of the testimony given by Palestinians about what happened during Operation Castellet. And, and in fact, if you go through the report, I have an article on it, and you go through the report and just see how many times they say credible, every single testimony they got was credible. They didn't find any testimony that was not credible. And when she was asked about this, she said, it would be cruel not to believe their testimony. Now, that's a judge. No, that's a postmodern literary critic who's a moral episode. So that's the problem. I, I'm, I think we have to maintain our self-critical capacities, and I think it's terribly important to be able to admit you're wrong when you're wrong. But if you're dealing with somebody who cannot admit to being wrong, then admitting to being wrong to sort of get the ball started is a mistake, because what you do is you, you, you elicit hostility. In other words, instead of saying, and this happened in Oslo, there's a whole school of Israeli scholarship known as post-Zionist or the new historians and so on, who were very critical and they said, we kicked out a lot of Palestinians and we did bad things and Benny Morris was one of the big ones and I'd be the, the guys. And so, um, Tom said, yeah. And, and the idea was, this is our contribution to Oslo. We're going to say we're sorry, we feel your pain. And they, they, then they can forgive us. But their response was to say, ah, we knew you bastards did that. We, we've been saying that all along, and now you finally admit it. So we're right to want to kill you. When you no. Okay, so you do that once, but you do that twice, three times, four times, you keep doing it, then you're crazy. Other questions? Yes, there's a question here. Um, I, um, I think it's important to point. Or, 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 or another example would be 
German ambassador from the RA, from the German uh, leading television. He was in February on Tahrir Square in Egypt, and he was uh, <laughs> deliberately showing on television, in German television, uh, for millions and millions of people more watch this uh, news uh, at 8, 8 p.m. Uh, he was showing a guy who was showing a poster uh, on the camera showing Mubarak with his swastika and that stuff. Right. They right. literally, it wasn't by accident, right. you know? And he was not intimidated, this guy, your arm poster, it's his name. Right. So, okay. it's a question. Yeah. Right, so uh, there are a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, there, there was, uh, there's a journalist who works for the BBC named Alan, I forget his last name, but anyway, he, he, he was kidnapped in Gaza for a long time, um, and he was finally released. And the striking thing was that when he was kidnapped in Gaza, he, first of all, he was the last journalist who lived in Gaza. And we are sitting at home watching on our TV screens pathological processes being played out with us as the victims. So yeah, I think it's a form, I think it's a result of intimidation. I mean, look, the other way you can go is you can say that these are people who, first of all, I think everybody is on some level intimidated in the sense that they know that if they stop doing what they're doing, they're in trouble. The, the, there was a journalist, a guy named Seeger, who, um, very pro-Palestinian. I exchanged some emails with him and stuff. He was a photographer. He was at Ramallah the day of the lynching. And he got, to, his camera was smashed, and um, he was terrified. And he wrote an article for the, I think, the Telegraph, um, entitled, I'll Have Nightmares for the Rest of My Life. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a searing description of what went on. And his friends immediately called him up and told him he better get out of there because he was in trouble. Now, he was somebody who was embracing the Palestinians. He would have told you, and he admits it in the article, I thought these people were the most wonderful people in the world. I used to sit and have coffee with them and tea and so on and so forth, and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, they turned into monsters. So, um, so I think there's intimidation everywhere, everywhere, but then, you know, the other direction you can go is into a psychological discussion about identification with the aggressor. These people identify with the aggressor, and it, it's it's crazy. And I think that on some level, and again, I think this is important for uh, German and European audiences to think about. I think that the Palestinians have been the proxies for a, a European and a Western anti-Semitism that cannot express itself since World War II. So why is there still a Palestinian problem? Why are the Palestinians refugees? Because nobody will stand up and say, this is outrageous. And why will anybody stand up? I think some people may be intimidated, but I think others think that Arab hatred of Israel is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a substitute. It's, a, it's an ersatz, it's a, it's a proxy way to express hostility. And it's been disastrous. I mean, the, the consequences of that sort of underhanded, behind the back, expression of ill will towards the Jews has in fact produced possibly the most dangerous apocalyptic millennial movement on the planet. Um, this is terribly dangerous and it's catching and once it hits the proportions of a forest fire, you can't put this thing out. I mean, this is not going to be put out easily. But one of the things that we have to do, you said, let's get to something, right? The first thing that we have to do is we have to start thinking like them. Not actually thinking like them, but thinking about how they think and how they experience things. So for instance, on the question of admitting fault, you know, if you say, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, and, you know, when I say it to my wife, she gives me a hug, so when I say it to the Palestinians, won't they give me a hug? Well, they won't. And the reason that they won't is because they're not your wife and they're not thinking in those terms. And if you don't think about the way they think, take uh, the mosque in New York, the Brown Zero Mosque. I mean, you know, there was an event at BU, everybody, you know, four people, all of whom said it is a shanda for America to deny the, the Muslims the right to build a mosque, and it's not really a Brown Zero, and it's not really a mosque. Well, the guy who, who, uh, who came up with the idea, called it the Ground Zero Mosque, right? And the point is not to say, I want to look good, 
I want to look tolerant and therefore I'm going to say, sure, go ahead and build the mosque. One of the things that we have to factor into our decision making is how will they see it? And the fact is that in the history of jihad, the main thing that everybody wants to do, jihadis, is to plant their mosques where they've conquered. So to build a mosque where you just knock down those twin towers is a hugely symbolic event. And if you don't understand the symbolism of that event, and you say, hey, this will make us look good, again, you're putting a gun to your head and pulling the trigger. Would it be one mean of um, fighting against uh, this, uh, this situation uh, be um, um, try to look for ways to spread the idea of civil society in Islamic countries? What do you think about um, the Arab, Arab Spring? What, are, there ten, are there good tendencies in it? Uh, are so, there, right. How do you think about it? I, I, look, I think it's terribly important to identify uh, moderate Muslims. I believe there are moderate Muslims, and I think we have to identify them and support them. Um, on the other hand, um, it's a disaster to identify a false moderate as a moderate. It's a disaster to take something like in America, we have an organization called CARE, Committee for American Islamic Relations. It's a Muslim Brotherhood Front. It is It is a disastrous organization that has no commitment to democratic values. They use democratic values. They insist that um, uh, people not insult Muslims, people show dignity, give Muslims dignity, and so on and so forth. They will use everything they can to defend Muslims, but they have no commitment to defending the same rights for others. And this is the real problem in And our journalists are not too bright, no offense. Even the smart ones are not too bright. Um, they go to the Arab world and they say, oh, the Arabs want democracy. They say they want democracy. Okay, so did you ask them if they're willing to make the necessary sacrifices for democracy? And these guys don't even know what the necessary sacrifices for democracy are. They're not in a position to say, well, for one thing, it means giving up honor killings. Are you willing to give up honor killings? Are you willing to treat, you are really willing to allow free speech not just to yourself but to others? I mean, these guys who are demonstrating we want the right to criticize Mubarak are not saying we want the right of somebody else to criticize me. And when they vote for fundamentalist parties, Islamist parties, they're essentially saying we don't believe in free speech. We believe in our free speech, but not in your free speech. And that's the basic. So reciprocity. So yes, reciprocity is absolutely crucial. We have to find people in that part of the world who believe in reciprocity, we have to strengthen them. Instead, we undermine them because we strengthen people more. The other thing that I say is, and this is, this is my great message of hope to you, um, and uh, I hope to make a, a, a third career of this, um, honor shame is a key thing. You, you mentioned Saeed. Um, Saeed basically made it shameful to talk about honor shame. Um, the, the message of Saeed's book is, how dare you Westerners other the Arabs? How dare you say things that we don't like to hear, right? And so when you describe us as honor shame, that's disgusting. Well, the fact is, Edward Said is the best illustration of honor shame that you can get in the intellectual community. And that book is a scandal. And particularly in Germany, it should be obvious that it's a scandal because there's a huge German Orientalist body that's got nothing to do with imperialism, right? And he's saying, don't you dare essentialize the Arabs? Well, he essentializes us and says every single Orientalist is by nature a racist. Ludicrous stuff, but the point that I want to make about Arshim is it's an enormous vulnerability for us. If, as you wanted to do, or your editor wanted, Do. If every time something came up, whether it was Salman Rushdie or it was the Danish cartoons, and they said, we are offended, and we plastered it everywhere, they wouldn't be so quick to say we're offended because they know it's just going to make things worse for them. But instead, we go, so? And it's crazy to do that. We just encourage their aggressivity. We have enormous power over them, and instead of using it, we're terrified. Okay, there's another question here.
Then the question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Richard, can you? Yes. It's a brief one. Um, with the with the media, it's it's really shocking. And question to to ourselves right now is, aren't we ourselves a little bit guilty if we rely so much? We want to watch the news, the eight o'clock news in Germany. That right. we have to watch that fifteen minutes total time. Right. So you get this little twenty second <coughs> So right. we rely on that. I think in the states it's even more. You get these little things. Okay. Newspapers. We rely on right. the editors. Right. My, my answer would be already, isn't what we should do maybe to, to, to cancel those subscriptions to newspapers where the editors are just doing this stuff, to go to the internet, to go like to good blogs, like yours maybe, and to get our information ourselves, isn't that what we can do? Otherwise, uh, if we sit there, we want to get this, not, not information but entertainment, then, then we don't have. Okay, um, two things. One, um, definitely you should be getting a whole lot more information uh, from the internet than just from the newspaper. Anytime you read a newspaper, yeah, first of all, you have to develop what in, in America we call a crack detector. <laughs> what are you trying to say that in German? Scheiss detector. All right, so you have to, you read an article or you listen to somebody on the news, and, and bells should be going off, and you say, it's something fishy about this, and then you go search on the web. For activists, there should be a web shadow site for every major publication in Germany, to keep it honest. In, in England, there's an organization called CIF Watch, Comment is Free, which watches The Guardian. Mm -hmm. And The Guardian has had to respond. It's, it's embarrassing. The media has embarrassed itself. It's up to us to keep the heat on. So there should be a website that does a constant, and so people know that, and when they're reading something and they say, huh, this is funny, then they go to that website, and sure enough, they get connected to blogs, et cetera, et cetera. But there should also be basically blog aggregators. I gather that's what you do, you, you aggregate this. But ultimately, and the aggregators can become the new, new mainstream media, we need a mainstream media. You cannot do without a mainstream media. And we need to get them to start behaving. We need to get them to start, for instance, every single TV studio that does news and has a correspondent and cameraman in the Middle East needs a Hollywood review committee. Every single piece of footage that comes in goes before that committee. And if we were to filter out all of the cameramen who shoot phony scenes, I can tell you that Arab Israeli conflict would appear on your TV screens an awful lot less than it does. So uh, the end is near, but we still have two questions. <laughs> there was one question uh, by uh, uh, Sir in, in the last, uh, second last row, and there's one question here. And then I think we really should uh, um, uh, end uh, our discussion because uh, I think Michael wanted to say something. So, okay. I agree with you that there are many cases of intimidation and stupidity uh, in the West in confrontation with Islamism. So, like uh, the history of Russia, there are tunes. But uh, I think you have shown a very important document uh, which points, in my opinion, to a much more bigger problem, which was this quote by a journalist who says, The death of this child annuls the death of the child in the Russian ghetto. And I think um, you can't explain this by intimidation because, first of all, why would they switch to a crime which was mainly perpetrated by Germans and Europeans? And what, how do they fit it together? How can a death annul another death? What, what strange is this? And so I think um, much of this leniency and much of this promotion for Islam, Islamist hatred in the West is an inner problem of the West itself. It's, yes. is, let's call it anti-Semitism, it's anti-civilizatory anti -civilizatory hatred. And uh, so I would say um, the front line for me is between people who are anti-Semites, who are anti-solicitory, and the people who are willing to defend freedom of speech and rights, so on. And 
uh, I don't see it so clear that that you can define it uh, like in uh, geographic terms. Gotcha. That, uh, that's, it's here, it's we, it's uh, Europe and America and Israel, and then it's, uh, it's the Orient. Okay. Because uh, there are many people uh, in the Orient uh, who, uh, who are much more radical than many so-called secularists or so yeah, in uh, defying Islamism or even Islam. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so first of all, I think you're right. Um, let me just uh, make one small correction, but it's a significant one because it gets to the issue of, of images and TV. She said this image erases the image, not the death, because in fact the boy in the gate, uh, from the ghetto survived. Um, but she, what she said was this image erases, and what she was saying was, um, excuse me, speaking in her voice now, she would never say this, but excuse me for my attention deficit disorder, but I can only keep track of one thing at a time. And so now that I have this big, powerful, emotional image, it's wiped my slate clean, clean about the Holocaust. And what, the reason why she had such, she said it, and, and she had such resonance. I mean, today she's ashamed. She won't even talk about it. You can't, you can't interview Catherine Ney and ask her about that sentence. She'd never make it again. But at the height of the anti-Israel sentiment, she made this statement, and basically what it was, was a get out of Holocaust guilt free card. You know, this picture, I no longer have to feel bad about what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. It was a relief. And so in Paris, you know, my friend Nidra Kohler was the one who introduced me to all this and coined the term lethal narratives. Um, you know, she was an expatriate living in Paris. She married a Frenchman. She has uh, French grandchildren. She's been living there since the early 80s. She had lots of friends. After 2000, she lost all her friends. Because all of a sudden, people started spewing stuff, not just about the, the Israel, but about the Jews. And anybody who defended Israel, and a number of non-Jews said this to me, French non-Jews said to me, you know, people would start talking uh, nasty stuff about Israel, and I, uh, you know, uh, objected. And they said, oh, I do not know. We just assume that if you defended Israel, you had to be Jewish. Nobody, and I said that to said that to a Jewish French consul to Boston, and I said, and he said, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, who but a Jew would defend Israel? I mean, even he bought it. Okay, so now, but there's a different dimension to this that, that you mentioned anti-Semitism. I'm not going to argue one way or the other on that. I, I like to keep anti-Semitism for really wild, paranoid stuff, um, Hitler, global jihad, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and I use anti-Judaism for the rest of the stuff, sort of garden variety. So, you know, it's my image of what's going on here is that the Europeans are drinking wine while the uh, Muslims are knocking back uh, hard liquor. Um, you know, anti-Jewish wine and anti-Semitic liquor. Um, but I think that one of the things involved here, and I feel it quite strongly from a number of my uh, friends in both America and in Europe, is a kind of moral shock for me. There's, there's some kind of thrill that Europeans, Gentiles, people like um, Jos Garger, Joshan Garger, Joshan Garger and stuff that they feel in being able to point to the Jews and say, Jews, 2,000 years you were oppressed by other people, and no sooner do you get power than you turn around and do it to somebody else. In fact, you're not only as bad as everybody else, you're as bad as the Nazis, you're worse than everybody else. And somehow, again, it's a relief, you know, I, I don't have to feel guilty anymore because the Jews are guilty. So, this is insane, this is morally crazy and self-destructive. And I'll end with um, a, a cautionary tale. The first chapter in the book uh, in which I deal with a particular case is the case of the Kosa uh, tribe in South Africa, um, which in 1856, a young girl came in from the fields and said, I talked to the ancestors and they said, if we kill all our cattle, um, they will return with bigger, healthier cattle. And if we don't plant our crops, they will bring bigger and better crops. 
And so some of them did this and they killed cattle and stuff. And when the ancestors were supposed to return at the full moon and they didn't, the response was, we didn't kill enough cattle. And full moon after full moon, every time the ancestor didn't return, they killed more cattle until they killed 400,000 head of cattle and 40,000 of them starved. Okay? And I think that that's what we're engaged in. We're in a situation where instead of saying, this is not the way to go about doing this, we just keep doing it. And my image of you know, the European anti-Zionist is he's like a 300 pound guy who's got a terrible cholesterol problem and he can't stop eating, you know, washing down his, his bacon cheese hamburger sandwiches <laughs> with truffles of moral schadenfreude. It just tastes too good. I can't stop. I can't stop. Okay, we really have time. Last question. I just wanted to thank you very much for so many ideas and so many examples. Uh, I just heard yesterday, friends, non-Jewish friends from Heidelberg called me because they were shopping, you know, it's pre-Christmas time. In the main street of Heidelberg, there was a group of Germans calling for the German customers who are shopping for gifts for Christmas to be Christ good Christians and not to buy Israeli products because Gaza is a concentration camp. But they were so shocked they didn't know what to do, so they called me. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you're with me, but there's an actually hysterical piece. At one point, just before Operation Castlet, the Gazans were really playing up this uh, thing of them being in a concentration camp and the Israelis being so cruel to them and stuff. And they claimed that there was a, um, the Israelis had cut off the electricity. And so the Gaza legislature held a candlelight session and they had candlelight walks and so on and so forth. There was a picture of a poor baby um, in an incubator and so on. And the fact is that in all of the pictures there was electricity. In fact, the picture of the Gaza <laughs> assembly was done at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you could see the light streaming through the, 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 the shutters that were put up on the windows and stuff. And yet the media reported this as if it were an Israeli. So if there's any example of a media-created fiction, it's the Gaza concentration camp. And in fact, at one point, the Gaza the wall broke down, uh, from last night the wall down, and there was a flood of um, um, Gazans who went into northern, um, uh, northern Sinai. And they came back with three things, okay? Guns, drugs, and brides. <laughs> North Sinai women considered moving to Gaza a step up in life. Well, the media's not going to tell you that. It's scandalous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You gave us uh, many ideas and many uh, um, thoughts to think about. Uh, was not really optimistic, but uh, uh, I am um, <laughs> We, we never have to stop with uh, self-criticism because your uh, uh, speech was also a monument of uh, Western uh, self-criticism. So um, we have to continue in this way, but in a true self-criticism. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. And we wanted to say... Thank you.